Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week of study. We're uh, on our 46th study on uh, Daniel's last vision. And um, what we plan to do this week is draw Revelation 12, 13, and 17 on the line. And uh, it could be that, you know, this week we could finish up this study. It probably, though, will be done next week. Um, but we'll see how, how that works out. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for the meetings that we have each morning. And we invite your spirit to be here to teach us, to instruct us, to bring a conviction and a power to our lives. We pray for those watching these videos and studying these truths that you can lead and guide them. And we just ask, Lord, that you can be here now as we open your word together. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. And um, so we spent a lot of time uh, addressing Daniel's last vision. Now, in... Um, and how far we're going to go into Daniel chapter 11 after we get the beginning part. I mean, I think that we probably should go through a review of Daniel chapter 11 after we've done that first part. But mostly this study has been in a response to uh, Colin wanting me to look at um, really uh, Daniel chapter 11 in the context of what he has put forward as far as uh, Trump being reelected, Trump being um, uh, typified by Alexander and uh, some of the ideas there. And, and so we've spent time going through all of the background information, comparing scripture with scripture, following Miller's rules. And last week we came to see some things about Revelation 12, 13, and 17 that we hadn't noticed before, especially in Revelation 17 regarding the kings. And um, so one of the main things that we've seen is that we shouldn't assume that the heads are all the same and that the, the ten horns are all the same because the beasts are not the same beast. They don't represent the same thing. And then that the seven kings uh, are not the seven heads or the seven mountains that this is something else. And so we've taken that into account. Now, what we're going to try to do this week is place all of these on a line. And I've started doing that on my own. I've drawn it out already. Uh, don't have it drawn out here for you because I did it on the whiteboard, but we're going to basically do it again. And um, uh, so, so that everyone can kind of see the process that we're going through. Now, in order to do that, I needed lots of background information, and we're going to look at some of that information sort of in a condensed form, because I did a lot of reading, but I'm not going to go through all the reading that I did uh, to get the background on the history of Rome, um, and I'm going to try to bring things that we can look at that are going to help us understand the symbols better, because sometimes we read over this history, like in the Pioneers, and it's sort of assumed because... The pioneers, when they studied things, they understood Roman history much better than we do today. So they were very familiar with a lot of these symbols, and we're not. <clears throat> okay, so in Revelation 12, and in each of these versions, uh, verses, in each of these chapters, each of these beasts that are presented, there is a story that helps us place them. Now, we know that uh, Revelation 12, we have this great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars, which represents Israel. She's being with child, she being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Now, Catholics might look at this as, you know, Mary, you know, giving birth to Jesus, but we know that this is symbolic language. And uh, that this is a depiction, this woman is a depiction of Israel or God's church. Here in this case, it would be ancient Israel. And um, then we're going to see this wonder in heaven, a great red dragon. 
So this brings us back to Genesis chapter three. And uh, but this dragon is going to have seven heads and ten horns. So even though this is a symbol primarily of Satan, it's symbolized here in a way that we can place it in time. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with the rod with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So you get the 1260 days, which you also had in Revelation chapter 11. And um, so that can help us, you know, place this. That we know that that's going to be uh, bringing us to uh, the beginning of the 1260. Right. That's what Revelation 12 is doing. So it's giving us that period from the time of the birth of Christ uh, to um beginning of the papacy and, and then it's going to bring us back to this war in heaven and we discussed this war in heaven and this war in heaven um we can place that it does occur in the time of christ as well as before the creation of the world and um so there is you know different ways in which people in try to interpret this or place this but we can accept that this is referring to work that occurs in the time of christ now, Jeff had an article where he was trying to show that um, that this uh, this place is um, because he was going with Daniel chapter two, but he was using some of these verses, um, not so much this verse, but this idea that we could place uh, what happens with uh, uh, pagan Rome that we could place that all of these things are fulfilled in that time of Rome. And um, this becomes a bit of a, uh, um, you know, there's not 1260 literal days for Mary and Joseph. Clean. Um, so just a comment in the chat asking about that. Um, so this isn't referring to Mary and Joseph. This is referring to the church, this woman. This is the 1260 years of papal persecution that's going to follow. But we have this uh, timing, and I can't remember exactly how, how this was done. But the idea is that um, it, it basically is a preterist idea. The idea is that... Um, this, what, does anybody remember exactly how Jeff put that, dealing with uh, Daniel chapter 2, what he was doing there? Because he was placing this in the time of pagan Rome, and it was dealing with the Sunday law. And I'm trying to remember exactly how that worked out. Because um, he was dealing with the church as Pergamos. Um, but anyway, he was trying to show that we could place all of these things in the first coming of Christ with Daniel chapter two, so that the stone smites the foot of the image in the time of pagan Rome. Uh, so I wish I remembered better. Anybody remember exactly how Jeff did that? Dwight, do you remember what Jeff was doing there with Pergamus, with the churches? I remember going back through it this last week, but I'm not recalling it quickly right now. But part of the problem is because it doesn't make sense, it's hard sometimes for me to remember things that don't make sense. But but the idea was that we could we could place the stone smiting the foot of the image in the time of Christ, and that that would be in the time of Pergamus prior to Thyatira. But I can't remember the reason why he was making this point. Um, so it, it seemed like that he was making the point that the stone would be smiting this be, in the time of Christ, or at least beginning the approach to smite it when he came to this earth 
and that the smiting occurred after the 1260 years when they came to 1798. Yeah, yeah, because part of it had to do with the placement of the Sunday law in the time of Pergamus. Right. I can't remember the reasoning behind that. Um, Because it had to do with the message basically being repeated. So he was using like, uh, I'm going to have to look at it again and bring it up. But but anyway, the point is that's why we we looked at this and talked about this. So so we can't we can't say that Daniel chapter two is is fulfilled in the time of Christ. That the stone smiting the, the image, obviously there's a process of it. My view is that Daniel uh, chapter two just doesn't fill in the detail. So he was trying to fill in the detail with these with the clay and the iron that he was making this distinction that it basically the details that we see in later visions are in Daniel chapter two. But, but we know that that's not the case because in a repeat and enlarge more detail is added. You can't, you can't take the visions of Daniel chapter seven and the visions in revelation and see those details in Daniel chapter two, they're not there. So um, that and that was what he was trying to do, and and this is something Parminder did, and I'm not saying that like to muddy the waters or you know by association with Parminder or something. I'm just saying it's it's an error that was made, and it comes from preterism, and. And it doesn't it doesn't agree with how we understand the scriptures, how this movement has understood them, how the Millerites understood them. They wouldn't have tried to add those details into Daniel chapter two that aren't there. So um, so when we look at Revelation 12, because we're going to draw this on a line, we're going to start doing that today. Um, I just wanted to review the chapter and. um so we can see even here um, when it talks about this battle, this battle refers to the battle that began before the beginning of the world and ends. Right. So it brings us it gives us this broad picture. So this war in heaven between Michael and the dragon, this is just giving us th- this zoom out view of this whole picture that uh, Revelation chapter 12 is part of that story. And and that story is the story of the seed of the woman and the the serpent, right? Because that's the gospel. So the fact that Revelation 12 zooms out and gives us this whole picture of the great controversy, we wouldn't just say, well, this all just happened in the time of Christ and this was done, right? We know that the war in heaven began before the creation of the world and the um, it it happened, it was acted out at the time of Christ and it's going to be finished at the end of the time at time. And this serpent, he's going to be, you know, bound to the earth for a thousand years. That's again, he's going to be cast out to the earth. So, but then it's going to, in the context of this great controversy, it's going to talk about this woman, how she's going to fly into the wilderness, right? So it's going to go back to this 1260 years and show that the church is hidden in the wilderness for a time, times and a half a time. Now, the interesting thing about this, so when we deal with the 1260 in Revelation, right, because you have it in Revelation chapter 11, right, they're going to have the 42 months and then the 12, 1,203 score days. And then in Revelation 12, you're going to have the 1,203 score days. And then you're going to have the time times and a half, right? So in these two chapters, you're going to have the three different ways to describe the same time period, which is one of the keys that we know that a time is a year of 360 days, not 365 or 354 or 364 or anything. And that a month is a month of 30 days prophetically, right? Um, and so the 1260 days is the same period as 42 months. It's the same period as time times and a half. 
And you may have run into people who, I have anyway, who try to say that they're different periods because they're described in different ways. But it's pretty clear this is the same period here in Revelation 12. And we have the time times and the dividing of times and times and times and a half in Daniel uh, 7 and 12. Um, uh, and there they don't have, uh, you know, explicitly a period of 1260. That we're going to get from Revelation. They're just going to talk about uh, it in this term. So now we can know that that period of time, time, times and a half in, in Daniel is 42 months, is 1260 days. Without these verses in Revelation, we wouldn't know that specifically. Right? And, and since uh, the one in Revelation 7, verse 25, is talking about this same period, uh, the one in 12, verse 7, is talking about the first 1260. But these three are all talking about the second 1260 that make up the 2520 for northern Israel. Um, you know, so we can know for a certainty that those symbols are being used and that they're symbolic times, not literal times. Um, so then we, we come to the end at Revelation 12. It's going to go through this period of 1260 then in this next part of Revelation 12 and bring us to the end of it. Um, right, because that's where Revelation 13 is going to begin. It's going to begin at the end at the end of the 1260. So Revelation 12 basically brings us all the way from the time of Christ into this 1260 year period. And then we're going to see that in Revelation 13, it's going to pick up from there. <clears throat> so that's just, that's just a summary of Revelation chapter 12. Now to place this on a line, uh, we addressed all of these symbols and we're going to look at them in a little bit more detail. So we're going to do this for each of these uh, seven-headed beasts. In this case, it's the great red dragon of Revelation 12. And um, uh, I've already done some work here on this. And I've, I've drawn out just this, just our standard line with the, the first and second angel's message, the third and then the fourth. <clears throat> and so this is just kind of set up as a worksheet. Now, what I have on the bottom, and I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. Maybe you can see that a little better. It's pretty tiny, um, at least on my laptop, on my computer screen. It's nice and big. Uh, what we have here is these different tens and sevens. Uh, we have uh, the monarchy. So there's the first seven kings of Rome, which we're going to look at today, and then the seven hills of Rome. So we're just going to start trying to put this on a line. Now. We're, uh, so that's what we're going to be doing. I hope to see how far we get today. Now I'm going to share another screen here. Um, okay. Okay, so this is the history of the Roman kingdom from 753, so April 21st, 753, to 509 BC. And I've read lots of other things, but this is just, I found a fairly good summation of it. Um, now, the thing about the history of the Roman monarchy or the beginning of Rome is there's a lot of legendary stories that are attached to it. Now, that sometimes makes people, historians, scholars, sort of think that maybe the whole thing is made up and those people didn't exist. But usually with a legend, these stories that are attached, just like we have with America. There's lots of sort of stories, you know, George Washington cutting down the cherry tree and all those types of things that we, we that aren't true stories. But does that mean we we discount the fact that George Washington existed? Right. Now, of course, we can say we have lots of evidence that he existed. But but the fact that stories are attached to heroes of the past that are fantastical or, you know, maybe don't quite describe when we start looking at archaeology exactly what happened in Rome. It doesn't mean we discount the whole story. We just know that the story over time has had these dramatic flourishes added to it. Um, 
but it doesn't mean that, that we discount it. So the idea that Romulus founded the city on the top of the Palatine Hill at 753 BC, we maybe could doubt that date. We don't know if that date is correct because this is stuff that was written in the third century. That's the earliest account we have of this. Um, and there are different dates that are given in Roman history as far as when Rome was founded, but they finally settle on this 753 BC. So that date itself as a date may not be correct. But Romulus, maybe not with the name Romulus, but Romulo, he may have um, existed, or Romo, sometimes people have different names that, that, they, that they have in different documents that would point to this person. So, But he would be the one who founded Rome. Now, it doesn't mean that Rome didn't exist, that people didn't live there um, on these hills in Rome, um, because there is archaeological records that go further back than 753 BC. Um, so people definitely uh, live there. But what he would have done is formed a city or a government um, that had some kind of civil authority. So before people could live places, it doesn't mean that it's organized as a state or as a city. And so Romulus would have done this. And so the date they give us is 753 BC. And of course, you know, he had his brother, twin brother Remus and all that kind of stuff, which may or may not have happened. We don't know. So this period of the Roman Marconi, monarchy. So it says little is certain about the kingdom's history as no records and few inscriptions from the time of the king survive. And the accounts of this period written during the Republic and the empire are thought to be based on oral tradition. It ended with the overthrow of the kings and the establishment of the Republic in 509 BC. So we know that oral tradition can have things in it that aren't true, but they're generally based upon things that are true. So, so there's some truth behind it, what exactly the details are that we don't know. So during the Roman king and kingdom, seven kings ruled the city of Rome, Romulus, um, from five, 753 to 716, Numa Pompilius from 715 to 673, Tullus Hostilius from 673 to 641, uh, Ancius Marcus from 641 to 616, Tarquinius Prissus from 616 to 579 BC, Servius Tullius from 578 to 535, B.C. and Tarquinius Superbus from 535 to 509. The kings, excluding Romulus, were all elected by the people of Rome to serve for life, with none of the kings relying on military force to gain or keep the throne. The insignia of the kings of Rome were 12 lictors wielding the fasces faces bearing axes. I'm not sure what that word is, fax, fasces. Uh, Bearing axes. Uh, um, and I'm not sure what a lictor is. Anyway, the right to sit upon. The, uh, a, what's that? A, a property relates to a bundle of rods. A fascist okay. guy. So it's where we get the word fascism. Okay. Okay. And then the right to sit upon the carul chair, the purple toga, picta, red shoes, and white diadem around the head. So these are just the insignias, right? So I don't know much about insignias. I'm not. Um, but anyway, those are, are the symbols that are used. So after he killed his brother Remus, Romulus began building the city on the Palatine Hill. He permitted men of all classes to come to Rome as citizens, including slaves and free men without distinction. He is credited with establishing the city's religious, legal, and political institutions. The kingdom was established by unanimous acclaim with him at the helm when Romulus called the citizen, citizenry to a council for the purpose of determining their government. Romulus established the Senate as an advisory council with the appointment of a hundred of the most noble men in the community. So, I mean, what we would probably know is that things existed before Romulus. He didn't just start the city out of nothing. Then a lot of these traditions and ideas would have been around. But somehow there's this historical figure, even though he has legendary things attached to him, who, who does these things. It doesn't mean that there was no laws or religion or anything before, but he somehow pulls it all together. That, that's what I would guess at. Um, these men are called patres, which is fathers. 
right? And, uh, and their descendants become the patricians. And again, that's related to the fathers. To, pro to project command, he surrounded himself with attendants, in particular the 12 lictors. He created three divisions of horsemen, equites, that just means horsemen, called centuries, right? So century usually refers to 100, groups of 100. Um, and the Ramnes, the Romans, the Titis, after the Sabine king, and the Lysiris, the Etruscans. Now, so part of this thing that's, I don't know if anybody knows about the Etruscans and the Sabines. Um, so these are people in that area, right? Now, the Etruscans uh, were a city or an empire that existed. Maybe not empire is the right word, but they were this, this group of people that uh, the Romans are going to have a lot of wars against. But some of the Roman uh, monarchs are actually Etruscan birth. So it's kind of interesting. And I, I've watched some videos, history videos, dealing with some of the, the battles with the Etruscans and the history of the Etruscans and what we know. Uh, they had the same alphabet as uh, the Romans, but uh, a different language. Um, so it's kind of interesting. And... And, and it's on YouTube, you can watch lots of videos. Some are good and some are bad. Some aren't great videos. Some aren't well done. Some are. Um, but dealing with this history. But you have the Sabines and the Etruscans and the Latins would be the Romans. So he divided the populace into 30 curiae, named after 30 of the Sabine women who had intervened to end the war between Romulus and Tatius. Or Tatius. Tatius. Anyway, the curiae form the voting units in the popular assembly, the comitia curiata. And um, Romulus was behind one of the most notorious acts in Roman history. That's the uh, going in and taking all these Sabine women. And there's different stories about that. Um, he reigned for 37 years, according to the legend. Romulus vanished at the age of 54 while reviewing his troops on the campus Martius. Or Martius. He was reported to have been taken up to Mount Olympus in a whirlwind and made a god. After initial acceptance by the public, rumors and suspicions of foul play by the patricians began to grow. In particular, some thought that the members of the nobility had murdered him, dismembered his body, and buried the pieces on their land. These were set aside after an esteemed nobleman testified that Romulus had come to him in a vision and told them that he was the god Quirinius. He became not only one of the three major gods of Rome, but very the very likeness of the city itself. Of course, these are legends later on, so they might have nothing to do with the actual Romulus. Okay, and then the next one who followed is Numi, Numa Pom, Pompilius. So there was one year that they didn't have uh, a king. And then during that time, 10 men chosen from the Senate governed Rome in successive interreigns. So I'm not sure. So they had 10 men in successively governing during this one year period. So I don't know if they had like a month each or something like that. Under popular pressure, the Senate finally chose the Sabine. Uh, Numa Pompilius to succeed Romulus on account of his reputation for justice and piety. The choice was accepted by the Curia Assembly. Numa's reign was marked by peace and religious reform. He constructed a new temple in ja to Janus after establishing peace with Rome's neighbors, closed the doors of the temple to indicate a state of peace. They remained closed for the rest of his reign. He established the Vestal Virgins at Rome as well as the Salii, the Flamines for Jupiter, Mars, and Quir Quirinius. Quirinus. He also established the office and duties of Pontifus Maximus. Numa reigned for 43 years. He reformed the Roman calendar by adjusting it for the solar and lunar year, as well as by adding the months of January and February to bring the total number of months to 12. Now, uh, so this... The, the Roman calendar, even though we have these months of January and February, um, really it was a 10-month calendar. It's, it's a very strange calendar in how they constructed it. Um, and, and even later, these months in the winter were just not important months. It was, I guess, nothing happening then. Wintertime. 
Um, and so the year would actually begin in, in the spring, not in January. And you can see, of course, by the, 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 the names of the months, you know, uh, um, uh, so December being the 10th month, so January and February would be the 11th and 12th months. So the first month would be, you know, March, right? So I'm not sure exactly what he did with this solar and lunar, lunar year, because a lot of this is, there's not real documentation for this. But we do know that later on, uh, some of the reforms in the calendar that happened. So this is a solar and lunar year. So that means it's some kind of solar lunar calendar. That's that's all we know about it. Okay. But it's kind of interesting. And here they have uh, a calendar with the different months on it. Uh, that's from the first century AD. So that's not from that period. Then we have this other guy, Tullus Hostilius. So what you're going to see with these different kings is these battles that are going on. Now, so the Etruscans and the Sabines and the Latins, these are all, um, Rome is made up of these different groups of people, yet those groups of people, the Etruscans and the Sabines, exist outside of Rome. And so they have wars against them. But you still have people who are kings who are Etruscan. Right. Um, so looking at this history, I'm not going to go through all of this, but you're just going to see there's these seven kings and they talk about the different things that they do. Some of them um, uh, adding the hills to the city of Rome. Um, so uh, let me see, was it here? So, you know, they're going to start like things like the sewer system, uh, the first bridge, um, the Pons Asiblicius, and the most famous of, is the Circus Maximus, a stadium for chariot races, uh, built a, a temple, right, to the god Jupiter, Optimus Maximus on the capital Toline Hill. We're going to look at the hills in, in a bit more detail. Uh, Priscus was succeeded by his son-in-law, Servius Tullius, Rome's second king of Etruscan birth, and the son of a slave. Like his father-in-law, Servius fought successful wars against the Etruscans. He used the booty to build the first wall around the seven hills of Rome. So here you have this wall. So you can see these seven hills. And we're just going to look at another video just dealing with those hills to get a picture in your mind. It's a little bit hard with this map to kind of uh, to understand that, but... The idea of these, uh, so it's called the Servian Wall, uh, Maris Servi Tuli, and um, you can see the Tiber River on the left side, the west side here of the city of Rome, and these different hills. Uh, Servius Tullius instituted a new constitution, further developing the citizen classes. He instituted Rome's first census, which divided the population into five economic classes and formed the Centuriate Assembly. He used the census to divide the population into four urban tribes based on location, thus establishing the Tribal Assembly. He also oversaw the construction of the Temple to Diana on the Aventine Hill. Servius's reforms made a big change in Roman life. Voting rights based on socioeconomic status favoring elites. However, over time, Servius increasingly favored the poor in order to gain support from the plebeian class, often at the expense of the patricians. After a 44-year reign, Servius was killed in a conspiracy by his daughter, Tullia, and her husband, L. Tarquinius Superbus. And he's going to be the last. The seventh and final king of Rome was this guy. Um, and they put L there. It's another name, but... Uh, Tarquinius Superbus, he was the son of Priscus and the son-in-law of Servius, whom he and his wife had killed. Um, so there's going to be these wars that go on. Um, he's very violent in his control of Rome and had disrespect for Roman custom and the Roman Senate. And so tensions came to a head when the king's son, Textus Tarquinius, raped Lucretia, wife and daughter of Tarquinius Co. 
Latinus and I don't know all these different names. Lucretia told her relatives about the attack and committed suicide to avoid the dishonor of the episode. Four men led by L. Junius Brutus and including this other guy, um, all these different guys, they had a revolution and expelled Tarquinius and his family from Rome in 509 BC. Tarquin was viewed so negatively that the word for king, rex, held a negative connotation in Latin language until the fall of the Roman Empire. Julius Caesar was famous for rejecting the title of king, and rumors of his ambition to become a king led to, in part to his assassination. Right, so that's going to be back. It's, it's going to just bring us back to some other history. So um, here we're going to look at... Um, this video. So I need to actually share it so you can hear. I don't know if we need the sound. I can't remember. Um, Rome was famously famous famous seven hills. Those seven hills are the Aventine, Caelian, Capitoline, Esquiline, Palatine, Quirinal, and Viminal. Seven Hills of Rome. One of the stories of Remus and Romulus, the legendary twins who were said to have founded Rome was that Remus wanted to build on the Aventine Hill and that Romulus preferred the Palatine Hill. Romulus's victory in this struggle, as the story goes, meant that the city was founded on the Palatine on April 21, 753 BC. Each of the seven hills had its own culture originally, and the people living on those various hills worked together to drain the marshes in between and, later, build the Servian walls. Plebeians primarily lived on the Aventine Hill, which was also home to the Temple of Diana and the Temple of Minerva. The Caelian Hill was the preferred location of the wealthy during the Roman Republic. The Capitoline Hill had the Tarpeian Rock, from which Rome at times tossed villains to their deaths below. This hill was also home to the Temple of Juno Moneta. Tallest and largest of the seven hills, the Esquiline Hill was the setting for several well-known constructions, including the Golden House of Nero, the Temple of Claudius, and the Baths of Trajan. Many an emperor had his palace built on the Palatine Hill, which also housed a number of temples among them the Temple of the Magna Mater and the Temple of Apollo and Festa. The northernmost of the seven hills is the Quirinal Hill. The Sabines lived there in ancient times, as did Numa, the second king of Rome. The Viminal Hill was sparsely populated with buildings. Known to have been there were a temple to Serapis built by Caracalla and the Baths of Diocletian. Okay, so that's a pretty quick... Um summary of those hills but uh so when we look here at this chart when we're talking about the great red dragon we know it has seven heads and ten horns right and there's seven crowns upon its heads now different people have tried to apply what this means now it is possible that the seven heads with seven crowns just refer to the beginning of pagan Rome with these seven kings. Or at least the seven kings become a symbol of something. Now, I didn't put in here the seven forms of Roman government, but we are going to look at that as well. Uh, but I wanted to look here just dealing with pagan Rome itself. So would there be anything wrong with saying that the seven heads of the dragon that have seven crowns could have some reference to the first seven kings in the founding of Rome as a symbol. <clears throat> but that would be something that helps attach it to, to Rome, to being pagan Rome. It's not usually a view that, you know, the pioneers didn't hold that view. They, thought it was seven forms of Roman government. Now, we also know that we have the seven kings, the first seven kings of Persia, the last seven kings of Judah. Um, you know, we've looked at these things before. Do you think that there's any significance that, at least in, at least in the, the legends of the beginning of Rome, that there are seven kings that, that deal with the, the monarchy from the founding of Rome to the Roman Republic. Is that significant? Should it be considered?
Yes, I would say so, because we 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 have all already set a precedent with the Persian and, and, and the other kings. Yeah. OK. And, and when we get to Revelation 17, when it talks about there are seven kings, you know, we're looking at modern Rome. So we know that pagan Rome has these symbols attached to it. And now one of the reasons why, um, because as we've looked at this, we know that the riddle dealing with the seven kings in Revelation 17, that it's always assumed by everyone that it's referring to the heads of the scarlet colored beast and that each of these beasts, the heads must represent the same thing. So that the seven heads of the, the great red dragon, the seven heads of the leopard like beast and the seven heads of the scarlet colored beast are always representing the same thing. And then they apply the riddle to it. So for them, in order to have it make sense, they have to have the seven heads be a progression of something that's happening in John's day, right? Because five are fallen. Well, you couldn't say, you know, Romulus, Numa, Tullus, Ancus, Lucinius are fallen. The one is, is Servius Tullius. And the one that's yet going to come and continue a short space is Lucinius Tarquinius Superbus, right? You couldn't say that, that that prophecy would make any sense. If the riddle is applied to the seven kings that founded Rome, it wouldn't make sense from a prophecy point of view. But if the riddle doesn't apply to the seven heads of the beast, then there would be a reason to say, well, you know, maybe those seven kings, the seven heads symbolize those seven kings. Right. And now they are, in a sense, typical as well. So those seven kings, we've already seen how we have applied them, not these seven kings, but the idea of the seven kings. Uh, especially when it comes to Persia and, and to the end of um, of Israel, right, as far as uh, ancient Israel with this, the last seven kings of Judah. So so it kind of makes sense that these seven kings should be considered. And that maybe that these beasts, the symbols that are there, are more expansive than we we have uh, applied them before because of how we've been looking at these beasts. Now, the other thing that we have are seven hills of Rome. So in this history, we have these seven kings, and then we have these seven hills of Rome. Now, I know that video went by really fast, but you got the Palatine. And the Aventine, those are those, you know, the Palatine is the one where uh, I believe Romulus, you know, wants to build the capital and Remus wants to build it on the Aventine, if I remember correctly. Um, and so you've got these different hills and what they have is these hills where people had been living um, and, and some of them with a little bit tr different tradition. Uh, some of them were Sabines, uh, some of them were. Tusk, um, Etruscans, um, but it, the Etruscan Empire was further north and it was fairly powerful and it was growing in this period. It was actually maybe even at that time on a decline uh, when Rome was uh, growing. And um, so they're going to bring these together, these seven hills, as, as a unit. So they're going to be cooperating together. And that's going to be done on Romulus, right? So, so these hills become important as a symbol because in Revelation 17, it says these seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth. That would be the seat of Rome. And they're within this wall um, uh, that makes up the city of Rome, right? So we're gonna, the wall is not going to be built right at the beginning, but it's going to be built later in the, the sixth king, I believe, builds the wall. Um, so, so the idea that we have this, these seven heads also representing the seven hills of Rome, um, at least in Revelation 17, maybe not in Revelation 12, but the idea that the, these, uh, 
we have mountains and mountains, of course, uh, you know, are going to be in Revelation 17. We can equate those with hills, but we don't have that explanation in, in Revelation 12. So even though we have seven hills, would it be sensible to say that the seven hills are going to apply later to the beast of Revelation 17? Even though they exist in the time of pagan Rome, that the heads there, because they have crowns, wouldn't be representing the hills or the mountains in Revelation 12. So it's just a question. Can we have it representing both? Would we exclude one? I don't see it representing both at that for for this purpose. Okay. Yeah, and, and I would say that, I mean, maybe it hints at a little bit. We can get from the idea of the seven heads. But but I would say because there are seven kings that begin Rome, that those seven heads would much, much better representation of just the founding of Rome to show that this is pagan Rome. And it's going to go all the way back to the monarchy. Now, I wasn't able to get together all of the things that I wanted to do with the uh, the seven forms of Roman government. So that's the other thing that we we have to look at. And, and part of that problem, because as I started to research the seven forms of Roman government, is it's kind of all over the place. It's not it's not a clear cut sort of view of things. And if I was going to take the seven forms, I would actually include the monarchy as the first one. That is, William Miller is going to have a list, which I think uh, makes the most sense. And I'm going to just go back there. Uh, there we go. Um, okay. Uh, Right. So when it comes to the seven forms of Roman government, William Miller says, um, maybe it wasn't Miller. Uh, no, so maybe it wasn't Miller who did it that way. Maybe it was somebody else. Um, well, they, he has, Miller has senatorial tribute Tribunate, consular, decimiver, triumvirate. These are fallen. One is imperial, and one not had the other had not yet come kingly, right? Now he calls that kingly, not papal, which really doesn't make much sense. Um, but um, you know, other lists. Um, so another one that the way that it's done is. Republican, consular, decimiver, dictatorial, triumvirate, imperial, and kingly. So that's also Miller. So he has two different lists with how he considers naming these things. When it's Uriah Smith um, talks about a guy named Osa Osiander as early as 1511, names the whole seven as we have them, namely Kings, consuls, decimivers, dictators, trumpers, emperors, and popes. Okay, so so that's your I Smith's view that that we have the kings. So he puts the monarchs in there, the consuls, uh, the decimivers, uh, the dictators, the trumpers, emperors, and popes. So I probably should add this list here um, to this chart. Now, um, so. Um, don't have a lot of room on this, but I'll just move this over. So we'll put in the seven forms of Roman government.
Okay, so these seven forms of government were um, monarchy, um, so the consuls. So we have um, Dictators, dissimilars. I'm just going to copy and paste this. Oops. Dictators. Now these different forms, does anybody want to just give us a rundown on what these are? What's the difference between these different forms of government? And why would they end up with this list? And I would have called. So I would have done it like this, monarchical. Well, when you're dealing with a monarchy, of course, you have a king, right? Yeah. When you're dealing with the consuls, the consuls of Rome were those that were appointed, I believe, generally for a year, possibly two, to be the kind of the director of what was going to go on within Rome. Under the dictators, you would have a party that held fairly ultimate power until the people decided that they didn't want them anymore. The Semivirs would seem to indicate like a rule of 10. Right, so they had like a, a group of 10 men that that worked together, yeah. Right. Now, I'm not familiar with the tribunal. Yeah, and with the dictatorial, the um, yes. thing about that is they usually pick the dictator in a time of war against a foreign nation. Right. So he and was the only dictator during the time they have this war. After that, then he would be removed. And they'd go back to the councilors. Right? Yeah. So in other words, you'd have one and then they would revert. Yeah. Now, so the tribunal here, um, I think that's probably in some reference to the triumvirate. That's okay. because that's what you have to try is three. But I'm just missing here. But that's the trim triumvirate. Or triumvirate, or how and, you say it. <clears throat> why are we calling it a tribunal when triumvirate would be more correct? Yeah, so that's probably what I would put, put the triumvirate. Tri um, triumvirate, how do you say that? Right, triumvirate. <clears throat> so under a triumvirate, of course, this is a rule of three. And there were several triumvirates. Yeah. After the last triumvirate, you began to have imperial Rome. Right. So you're going to have, with Augustus, you have the last triumvirate, but it, it devolves into him becoming the emperor. It segues to him becoming the imperial, yes. Okay. And then we just have the succession of emperors, and then finally... This moves into the papal form. Right. Seventh. So now the reason why they look at these seven forms of government has to go back to the riddle, right? So the idea is five are fallen, one is. So in order to create this seven forms of government as being the seven heads, they they need that 
for the expl explanation of the riddle. That's why they have it, right? Otherwise, I don't see any reason why they're looking for seven forms of government. Okay, so I, I'm going to throw an odd question out here. Okay. Can we apply this seven forms of government also in the way that things progressed with the United States? Yeah, well, that's one of the things we're going to look at later, because we're going to deal a little bit more with American history, um, like Jeff did, right? So remember, Jeff had addressed, um, you know, the beginning of the United States with the presidents. And, and so, you know, I think that that's something that has to be thought about. Um, because there is this progression of how the, the United States develops. So I, I don't know seven forms of government exactly because I haven't looked into it, but I think we need to sort of consider that. Um, because if we're going to say that the seven kings in Revelation 17 is referring to presidents of the United States, I mean, this kind of makes sense if we take that the seven, you know, if we go back and look at these different sevens in these beasts, and we can see that they have this association with uh, the seven forms of government, the seven hills of Rome, the monarchy. And then we're also going to have the seven kingdoms when we deal with the base beast of Revelation 13. But when we have been doing this, you know, all through this, um, through the history of Adventism, through this study, you know, it's always been with this idea in mind that the seven heads, five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. And that that must apply to all the heads, to all the beasts, right? That in each of the beasts, it's got to be true. Five are fallen, one is. And, and also that these beasts are all the same as far as what the heads are. Um, so Angela has... A statement which is Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9, um, which is, um, I think it's the one dealing with what it talks about the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be done, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there's no new thing under the sun. And um, so we can see, you know, history repeats itself. But God is, in a sense, in control of this history. Even though people are acting as individuals, making choices and decisions, um, that God sits enthroned. He oversees all of these things that occur. And um, his providence is always worked out. Now, you know, if we went back in actual history, you know, we might have a different opinion about the seven kings of Rome, that is, it might not be as clear cut as Roman, uh, you know, tradition has it. But the thing is, the fact that Roman tradition has these seven kings at the beginning has to be seen as significant, especially in the context of Revelation 12. So, so if I was going to look at this line that we have here, um, I think we do need to look at the seven forms of government and we need to mark out, you know, when these forms occurred. And, and we need to be able to place them on this line in some way. Now, the thing about this line, because we're, we're taking the model of Millerite history. And, and that means we need a period of darkness. We need a time of the end. We need, um, uh, a first message, what it is that's responding to the period of darkness. We need a formalization of a message. We need its empowerment. Um, and then we need a second message to arrive that, that proceeds from logically from the first message. That's going to, to test a different group of people. And then again, it has its formalization and empowerment. And then finally you get to the third angel's message. And, and that third angel's message isn't empowered. Instead, we have a repeat of history where the first and second angel's messages are repeated. 
and then they're going to join with the, the second angel, right? Is the is the one that joins with the third angel, swells to a light cry, all those different things. So, so these lines need to be consistent with what we understand. So to place this upon a line, I mean, we're not going to take the seven kings. I mean, maybe we could. We could place the pawn on a line and say, you know, we have seven kings and then, you know, we have this this progression of these kings. But that would just be a line of the kings. It wouldn't be the line of the great red dragon. So in order to place this on a line, the seven forms of Roman government could allow us to place these on a line. Right. But as we could look at, you know, the first angel's message is this monarchical form of government or something like that and then and then the next one is the consular and the next one is the dictatorial or something and but but i don't see how we would do that that is i don't see how these different forms of government symbolize these different way marks right and i don't think i could take the seven hills of rome from the little i know about them and place them on a line in that way. So, so I'm not really sure how to place this upon a line in that sense. But when we look at the Roman Republic, which includes the consular, the dictatorial, the decimoval, and the triumvirate, uh, those four forms, um, you know, we could some in some ways place this this Republican form of government as something because it, it does represent, because there's a parallel between the United States and Rome. And, and I do think, even though I, I don't agree with uh, Uriah Smith on how he tries to talk about, and, and the pioneers on how they try to take this form of uh Republicanism as something that ascends out of the bottom of this pit. It just doesn't really make any sense. Um, but there is something to this idea of the role of the Roman Republic in a parallel to our history. So that is, when in 1798, so, you know, if we look at the first angel arriving in 1798, that's going to be the arise of the American Republic, Right. It's the first angel arriving. So wouldn't we put this monarchical form of government as this, these seven kings preceding the time of the end and the rise of the Roman Republic as being the time of the end that is the first angel arriving? If we're going to parallel it with the United States, would that make any sense to people? You understand what I'm what I'm asking? Uh, say it again. Okay. So since the Roman Republic parallels the United States, could we place the Roman Republic as the arrival of the first angel in the idea of pagan Rome, that the monarchical form of government proceeds, that would be a parallel with the 1260 of papalism. And that when we have the first angel arrive, it's the arrival of a Republican form of government that marks the parallel with Millerite history in 1798. Is that a sensible idea to, con to consider? Should we even consider it is all I'm asking. Not is it correct, but could we consider it? We could consider it. We can also consider that they were basically under the monarchy of England at the time oh, as well. Okay. So the American, 
Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, so you could look at the, the English monarchy controlling the United States, and then you have a republic. However we look at it, the point is a republican form of government does parallel something that happened to Rome, right? Now, so the seven forms of Roman government, I'm not that interested in the seven, you know, all those seven forms so much, because I, I think they're sort of artificial. But, but the thing that I can say about it is if we look at the Republic itself, we are going to have um, uh, things that we have paralleled uh, already, Jeff has paralleled, to our history. And, and so I would just say it doesn't really matter whether it's a consular, a dictatorial, or dissimilable. Those are all under the Roman Republic, and even the triumvirate is. Or the triumvirate, however you say that. Um, it's it's all under the Roman Republic. It's not till you get to the imperial, and um, now maybe we could just you know you know break it down. Say that there is, uh, you know, the consular, the dictatorial, the dissimilar, and the triumvirate. We could somehow mark them as all, you know, different way marks in this. But I would just say that it. If we're going to mark uh, this period, I, I just happen to have this here just because, you know, the first to the second is a way mark. But what if we just said that this is the Republic? So if this is the Republic, But that's just the first angel's message. It, it parallels the first angel's message in some way. Now, now the thing is, we're dealing here with this, this beast that is pagan Rome. And, and we're making a parallel to the United States. Now, we don't have, you know, in, you know, 1844, you know, that somehow the United States moves from a republic to an, uh, an empire, right? So, so we're not making that parallel all the way through. Um, but, you know, if we were going to take these forms, uh, we would have the monarchical at the beginning, the consular, uh, the dictatorial, the similar, and the triumvirate would be here at this second angel arriving. So, it's still part of the Republic, but it's going to move into this Imperial and Papal. But in this case, we wouldn't have all different forms uh, to fit all of these waymarks, right? Because you would have the monarchical up to here, uh, the consular going from the first angel to the formalization, the dictatorial being there. And I don't know if we can make a parallel between these forms of Roman government and you know, Millerite history. I just don't know if we can do that. But at least we can say in some sense that at least with the start of it, that that republic would represent something about the United States. And maybe this republic would be be all the way, I, I don't know. You know. Maybe it goes further than that. That's just where I had the, the bracket, you know, that little span of time. But I just say, you know, here we have a republic. Um, it's going to start, you know, so I could have just simply done this, uh, take Republic and just put it here. Right. But then I don't, I don't know how I address this on a line. Now with the United States, um, United States is still a Republic, but it's going to speak as a lamb or, or have horns like a lamb and speak as a dragon. Right. Um. And I don't know how we would parallel that with Rome either, right? So, so you just see some of the problems here of, of trying to draw this on a line is, you know, how would we do this? We definitely can't take the kings and just make them seven way marks for the great red dragon. 
And I don't think we can take the seven forms of Roman government and do that either. Maybe there's some way in which we could do it. I mean, may, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we should just mark each of them as the seven way marks. Um, now, one thing we could say is that the fourth angel arriving um, is, if that's going to be the eighth, and he's comes from the seven, you know, is that, you know, how do how do we look at it? Right? You understand what I'm saying? Because we've been through this with the other beasts. But right now we're just dealing with pagan Rome. So how would we do this? And then we still have to deal with the ten emperors. Right? Now, notice my list of, so let's just look at this. So my list of the first ten emperors, I have Augustus, Tiberius, Claudius, Caligula, Nero. And then I have Galba, Otho, and Vitellius all marked as number six. So I mark the first five, one to five, and those that all reign in that first year, and in a sense, sort of co-reign, and not that they're, because they have different territory, ter different territories or parts of Rome that they're ruling, and just each one sort of takes a turn uh, to be uh, declared the emperor of Rome. And then finally, you have Vespasian, and I put him as the seventh. He's going to be the one. Titus is the general um, at the time of Vespasian. So, um, so he's going to be the one that uh, um, Vespasian is the emperor when Jerusalem is destroyed. So, so if we're going to look at this great red dragon and we're saying it's pagan Rome, we need to place this history in there. That is, we need to place the ten emperors. And if we're saying that the ten emperors are the ten horns of pagan Rome, that's one option that they represent these uh, uh, ten horns, three being plucked up, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius, and Vespasian is the one that plucks them up, so to speak, if you look at that history. Um, and that's going to end with the destruction of Jerusalem. But then we also have the 10 horns can represent the 10 tribes, right? And so we have this list from Stephen's study uh, that he, these, that's where I got these, this from. It's William Miller's list. It's on the 1843 chart, the Hans, the Othrogas, et cetera. And then we have the 10 tribes according to A.T. Jones, which is a different list. And I don't have the years for those. <laughs> so, so one of the things that we see is we said we have these seven heads and the ten horns, and we have different things that are vying for uh, the position as what those heads and horns are representing, right? So how do we sort through this with the great red dragon? Now, we know that Rome is going to fall. And, and I would definitely have no problem taking those 10 horns and applying these 10 tribes to the beast of Revelation 13. Just as I would have no problem in Revelation 13 attaching to the heads the symbols of the great empires of prophecy. But I don't know if we can simply just attach those 10 tribes to pagan Rome. They're going to cause the fall of pagan Rome, but they're not going to be, I mean, in a sense, you could say that they're pagan because they're, you know, they're not Orthodox Catholic, they're not Trinitarians, etc. But really they're not, they're not pagan in the sense that they become Christian. Um, uh, so I don't, I just don't know if I would put them in pagan Rome that I would put the 10 tribes as part of this great red dragon. I would say that if we're going to place something as pagan Rome, um, we need something like emperors. Now, of course, here I'm taking the emperors and I'm marking them as 10, but they're also marked as seven. Right. So I probably could have put, you know, like this. Actually, I only have uh, 
seven here, and then I need to put in the eighth. And the eighth is Titus. So I forgot to add that. Because if you take this list, you go seven, so it's seven and six, eight, and then nine, and then 10. So you actually get up to Titus is the 10th, right? But he's also the eighth, right? I don't know if this makes any sense at all. It's just, these are just working, trying to work through these, these symbols. And, and this is relating to Agilio's thing, right? Where he was trying to address the emperors and the parallel to, uh, to our history. So one of the things with uh, these emperors is we have them here in pagan Rome or in the imperial Rome. And he had, you know, he had started with Julius Caesar as the number one, right? And working his way through. So when the five are fallen, uh, Caligula is going to be the fifth. The sixth one is Trump. And so those things have to be considered as well. And maybe that doesn't apply here. Maybe it does. It definitely applies when we look at the riddle. The question is, do we apply the riddle to the emperors? And maybe we can but you know, part of this problem when we when we do that is if we're going to use Odilios, we have to count the first emperor. Emperor is Julius Caesar, which he's not an emperor. So why would we start with Julius Caesar? And it, if we're looking at the time of the end, that's going to be Augustus. So so we have all of these these problems that we have to sort through. Still, we we haven't resolved them. Right? This is just a way of working through this. Okay. So we got the emperors, we got the tribes. And, you know, in our history, so when we're looking at the Beast of Revelation 17, uh, we're also going to have the UN in there. Now, in the UN, we're not going to list off like 10 divisions of the world. We're just going to say the number 10 is just going to symbolize the world, right? That it, it's just a symbol of completeness of the world, just like 12 is a symbol of completeness of the church. Seven is is uh, a symbol of completeness, just as three is. The one's more perfection. The other one has to do with unity. Three has to do with unity. Um, so how would we proceed with this, trying to put this on a line? What If this is the great red dragon of pagan Rome, uh, we can take this republic and we would place this from when. So let's just let's just keep working on this, trying to. So if we're going to take the republic and it's going to start, it's going to start in 509, right? There we go, 509 BC. And when does the republic end? We're going to put it, what, 27 BC? Does that make sense to people? That's possible. Um, that's, that's what Wikipedia says. It says circa 509 BC to 27 BC. Um, and that's the establishment of the Roman Empire. Okay, so <clears throat> but there, it would be more correct instead of saying Roman Empire, it'd be more correct to say Imperial Rome. Imperial Rome, yeah. Okay, so the Roman Imperial Rome, yes. So you have Imperial Rome when you have the emperors. That's going to be twenty-seven. So that's the end of the Republic. So this is obviously an empire, but it's it's a republic. So here, that's going to be the end of the Republic. Now, that's 27 BC. So this is going to be um, with Augustus. And this is going to be the time of the end occurs in the line of Christ at this time, right? Because it's going to be in the 15th year of Caesar, Caesar Augustus or something like that. What's the year? Is it? Uh,
what does it say? It doesn't tell us the year of Caesar Augustus. It just says the taxing and the time. It's going to be the 15th year of Tiberius. Uh, when you're going to have uh, the baptism of Christ, right? Something like that. So it's going to be the time of Tiberius that uh, Christ is baptized. Ah, but this is Caesar Augustus. So that's going to be the taxing. Um, when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, there's a whole study that can be done as far as establishing when this is. So it's going to be in 4 BC. Uh, the Christ is born. So this would be a bit earlier, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so you're going to have a time of the end occur here. But this is just the great red dragon. So we know that we have this Republic is going to end. And now we have a second angel arrive. So, so when we address a period of darkness for papal Rome or pagan Rome, pardon me, uh, how are we, how are we marking a time of the end uh, in the first place? I'm just going to put the monarch, put seven kings here. Okay, so what, what is the period of darkness for Rome? And why would we mark uh, the Republic as, the beginning of the Republic as a time of the end? You know, Stephen said we can compare these seven kings to the United States being under uh, English rule. Why would we mark the time of the end? Okay, so this, this is a chart uh, that we have here. This is the sabbatical and jubilee cycle. And at the bottom, you'll see this part of this chart. And I don't remember what it was all about, but you have Imperial Rome, 27 BC to 538 AD is where we placed it, just for convenience sake. Obviously, Western and Eastern Rome are different and so forth, but the Roman Republic, 509 to 27 BC, we have marked. And we have this seven years marked. And then we have 83 times seven equals 581. And then we have seven years. So, so what is this about? Does anybody remember what we're marking? This is 1097 BC. So this is the anointing of Saul. So what, what, what is this chart trying to show? Why did we put this on this chart? So from the anointing of Saul to the beginning of the Roman Republic is 84 times 7 which is just simply 12 times 7 times 7, right? 588 years. <clears throat> so 
So is there any significance of that span of time from the anointing of Saul to the start, to the end of the seven kings? Now, here we have the number seven. This is from 516 BC, the second decree. It's going to be five, seven years until the founding of the Roman Republic. Right. So you can see that. That's why that seven is here. These are cycles of seven. But 84 times 7 to that period. Now, I had marked this in the past, right? So I go back here. Um, see this chart here? Okay, so this chart is one I made back in 2014. It's dealing with the two temples. It has the anointing of Saul. And notice there's 84 years from the anointing of Saul to the laying of the foundation of the temple, and then seven years to the temple being finished. And so I took the 84 times seven, and I got 588. And then I counted from the anointing of Saul, 588 to 509. I had no event there. And I have temple rebuilt. It's actually, you know, completed finally in 515, but it's the Jewish year, 516. And then I have seven years, and I just say it's seven years short, to 509. But 509 is the founding of the Roman Republic. So should this be considered at all, that there is this structure that relates to the building of the temple and the sabbatical cycles as well, that it relates to the founding of Rome? We noted it in the past. Is it significant? And if it is significant, what is its significance? What is it? What is it symbolizing or representing? Right. I have another chart here as well. Oops, where is the other one? Yeah, this is just the same thing, I guess. And then we have it here. So, what is this symbolizing? Is there any connection between Saul being anointed king? Uh, the beginning of the Roman Republic and the connection to the United States. Is there any prophetic significance there? I think it's uh, significant that it's 509 is uh, 508 plus 508 takes you to 508 <laughs> AD. Right. Okay. So so that brings us to the beginning of uh, of the 30 years to the 1335. Right. So when we talk about 509 BC, it's 508 years to 1 AD. Right. Right to to the to the place where the we get no zero right, and then you count five hundred and eight years, and that brings you to five hundred eight. So so five hundred nine equates to five hundred eight. If we had a zero year, it'd be five hundred eight BC. It'd be five hundred eight on the Gregorian calendar, which does use a zero year, the proleptic uh, Roman calendar or Gregorian calendar. I mean, so. So there is significance there. So what, so we can see that these things are connected. The anointing of Saul, the end of the monarchy for the Rome for Rome, and the beginning of the Roman Republic, right? And then also the connection to paganism being taken out of the way in 508 with that 30 years leading to the beginning of the 1260. So what is it symbolizing? What information is it giving to us? What is it, it telling us symbolically that we should consider? I'm just noticing you have 
Imperial Rome and in 538. Yeah, I know. That's just kind of, uh, it's not quite like that. But anyway, go on. Yeah, I would just maybe shorten that. I don't, maybe 476. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so we could put 476 in here if you wanted. Um, I was just trying to mark it up here with this 538 above. So so it's not really Imperial Rome ending there. Uh, but yeah, so you could put it like that, 476. Then I'd have to say, well, we have this period of time. Um, whatever that is. That's going to bring us to 538. So... So that's going to be what, uh, 24 plus 38. So 62 years. Yeah, so you got 62 years there. So uh, that would sort of connect with Darius. And uh, he's 62 years old when the fall of Babylon. It mentions that okay. in Daniel chapter 5, verse 31. Yeah, and okay. That's really the, the, and that's the, the end of the head of the golden image. And so maybe 476 is sort of them 62 years there. Could maybe okay. mark the uh, the end of the, the the iron of legs. Yeah. Of that image. And then you have a 1260 beginning yeah. in the uh, and, and then the 539 you have a, a 126 with a mini mini tackle you farsing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you can start to see that these these connections and these structures of time are not arbitrary, right? Even though we have like the sabbatical cycles and things in the, in the history of Israel, we can see that we can connect that to Rome, to the history of Rome, and the history of Rome we connect uh, with m the beginning of modern Israel, right? With the United States, so that there's a parallel there. So part of the problem that's happening here, so as we've spent so much time addressing all of this history, people would like these things to become simpler, right? Right. We should be able to just do this in a one hour presentation um, and that that we're making it too complicated. But are we making it complicated by doing this, by being thorough? I would think that being thorough would help unravel the, the the complications, but some people don't want to tax their minds and go through all this. Right. So I think it's unraveling the complications. That is, the more you study it, I mean, the more you realize there is to learn, and that definitely you have to keep a lot of balls in the air. You have to you have to keep a lot of things in your mind to consider to pull it together. So when you look at the wheels, they seem in confusion, right? But, but as we study, we start to see that these symbols, that people try to pick one symbol to fit something, that they're missing out and seeing the whole picture, right? And so this picture here is that we can look at the seven kings of Rome and we know that they're going to address the seven kings at the end, right? So now, of course, this is the great red dragon. This is pagan Rome. But if we're going to look up here at this fourth angel arrive, this is going to be the history of modern Rome. Now, within this 
great red dragon pagan Rome, uh, which is Revelation 12. Um, if we took the seven forms of Roman government, one of the forms of Roman government is papal. And we know that the papacy is a continuation of pagan Rome, but now dressed up in Christian garb, right? There's a transition of these two desolating powers. But right now we're just looking at Rome. You know, we're not going back to Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece here. We're just looking at Rome. Now, in 509 BC, <clears throat> when the Roman Republic begins, um, Uh, one thing we can say is that that this is the time of Persia, right? It's going to be seven years after uh, Cyrus's or Darius's, Darius the Persian, Darius the Great, after his decree that Rome is going to, to form as this republic. But it already exists as kings um, in the time that we would parallel with Assyria, Right? Even before Babylon, you know, you got, what is it? Uh, the monarchy runs from 753 BC. Oh, no, not 753. Where am I here? Yeah, the monarchy, Romulus. Yeah, so it runs from 753 BC to 509 BC. So, you know, if you're looking at 753 BC, you're dealing not with the history of Babylon. You're dealing with the history of Assyria, Right. It's going to be in 7, uh, you know, 23 BC that Assyria is going to take captive um, uh, Hoshea, right? So, so this history of Rome, hit, Rome exists, but it doesn't come into prophetic history until it's contact with the people of God. Right? Now, if we were going to mark these other way marks, I know our time is over already. I got carried away. And we're going to look at this tomorrow. We're going to look at these uh, formalization empowerment. I believe that we can place this uh, with events in Roman history. So we'll see how that applies. But anyway, sorry I went over time. This is just so interesting. Okay, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Your Father in heaven, we just ask for your continued care and protection for each person who is studying these things. We ask that you can bring us together again tomorrow to continue our study. And um, thank you for the things that you show us. Help us to continue to learn and grow. And we pray for one another. We pray for Brother Jeff. We pray for Toby. We pray for the American group, the Canadian group, and the people in it. We pray for anybody searching. For truth and we pray for ourselves lord that we can be converted that we can be humbled that we can learn in the school of christ be with us throughout this day we pray and ask in jesus name amen <clears throat>